So a reminder that your uh, cell anatomy labs are due on Monday. Okay, make sure you've got those finished and ready to submit for the start of class on Monday. Okay, um, and also a reminder that your unit exam is coming up on November the 10th. Okay, um, so that was two weeks from Wednesday when I put it up. Uh, so just make sure that you are starting to do some review. Okay, maybe make some little jot notes or flashcards or something like that to help you study. Um, I will do a review, same as always. Okay, so similar to what we did with the uh, chemistry unit, there'll be a review package and I'll do a review on the board and all of that. Um, probably on Friday next week, okay, I'll do that. Uh, so we've got a few activities that we'll be doing next week, um, but I'll have taught you everything by Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday will be the last day I'll be teaching new material okay, um, in this unit. Okay. All right, so the key points for today, uh, we need to look at the components and factors that affect plant growth and how they do that. Okay, so we're going to be looking at kind of parts of an ecosystem, parts of the environment, and, and how they affect plant growth, because that's going to be important on Tuesday when you are designing an experiment to test the effect of some factor on plant growth. This will give you an idea of what some things are that you might want to test. Okay, uh, so abiotic. Components are the non-living parts of an ecosystem, okay, and we've got them here. I want you guys right now on paper to see if you can identify what some of the non-living abiotic factors might be in that picture, okay? Abiotic factors that might affect the plant growth, so non-living things in that picture. Absolutely. Um, the rocks underneath the dirt path. Okay. How? Um, because when they try to put their roots down, the rocks would stop them. Okay. Could be. Yep. The water. The water. Yep. The dirt. The dirt. The soil itself. Yeah. Yep. We got sun already. Isaac. Isaac said sun. He's your buddy. <laughs> Temperature. Yeah. Okay. I mean, there's no snow on the ground, so it's obviously warm enough that plants are growing right there. Okay. So there's lots of things in the environment that are non-living that are important for plants to grow. In fact, it could be argued that they're more important than the living parts of the, of the ecosystem okay, uh, in terms of how a plant is able to function and grow in its environment. All right. So big factor, temperature. Plants require water to be in its liquid form in order for them to function and grow. Therefore, any temperatures below freezing make it very difficult for plants to be successful. Doesn't mean they can't be. Lots of plants can survive freezing temperatures. Some plants can even function in somewhat freezing temperatures. I'm not going to say that there's plants that do well at minus 30. Okay? Obviously, they don't. But you know, between 0 and, let's say, minus 5, some plants are still able to carry out photosynthesis and function and stuff like that. But it's very slow. Okay. Obviously, once the temperature really drops, nothing's happening because any water that would be in the leaves would freeze. Okay. Plants can secrete a type of almost antifreeze that will keep water uh, liquid for a while, but most plants, by the time freezing temperatures are dominant, have gone dormant anyway. Okay. Plants can recognize when days are getting shorter, and that's what usually signals their dormant period. Okay. Um, water. Obviously, plants can't grow without that either. Temperature can affect the availability of water. That's why temperature is listed first. Okay? It affects the availability of water. If it's really hot, obviously, it all evaporates. If it's frozen, well, it's pretty hard to absorb ice through your roots and transport it, stuff like that. Okay? Um, it's like, what's the driest continent? Which continent is the driest? Antarctica. It also has the most water. It's just one of those weird, you know, 
what is that called? Juxtapositions. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Um, it's it's got tons of water, but it's all frozen. Okay. It's it's very dry there. In fact, it gets less precipitation. Or Antarctica gets less precipitation than any other continent does. Okay. So very very dry. Doesn't mean there isn't a lot of water there. It's just not liquid water. Okay. So uh, water is essential to life, but obviously it's very its availability varies drastically among places. Okay. All right, sunlight. Obviously, sunlight is very important for plants because without it, photosynthesis is not going to occur. Okay, but of course, without water, there wouldn't matter how much sun there was. Okay, photosynthesis wouldn't happen anyway. All right, so sunlight provides the energy that drives nearly all ecosystems. Although only plants and other photosynthetic organisms can use it directly, light also influences lots of other things that go on for a plant in an ecosystem. Okay. Um, the amount of light received can influence the behavior of other organisms in the environment. All right? it, may, it may cue uh, animals to feed more heavily. All right? As days get shorter, okay, most herbivores um, and even omnivores like grizzly bears um, will feed heavily. Okay? They'll eat anything. And why are they doing that? Yeah, well, actually, bears don't truly hibernate. We, we were always told that as kids, bears hibernate for the winter, but they're actually not true hibernators. Okay? A true hibernator actually reduces its metabolic rate. Okay? That means that its heart rate goes down, its breathing rate goes down, its body temperature drops. Okay? Um, a ground squirrel, a gopher, they're true hibernators. Okay? If you ever um, come across a gopher in its, in its hole or a ground squirrel in its hole in the dead of winter, you'll think it's dead. Okay, like if you like were to pick it up, it would feel dead because it would be cold and stiff. Okay? Because they actually will allow their body temperature to drop to around like 10 degrees. Their heart beats only a couple times per minute. They might respire <laughs> once a minute. Okay? They would look and feel dead, right? Because their metabolic rate has dropped so far. A grizzly bear just sleeps a lot. Okay? It doesn't eat very much either, but it just sleeps a lot. Its metabolic rate doesn't really drop, okay? And then they come out in the springtime and they're really angry. <laughs> not, not that a grizzly bear is not like just upset generally all the time, but okay, um, they, they're really their blood sugar is really low in the spring, all right? So, um, but it does it will influence the eating behaviors of things that might eat the plants. So that would be something that would affect them. But it also triggers um, flowering and dormancy in plants, okay? Generally, plants are going to flower when days are quite long. Why is that? What do they get a lot of when the days are long? Sun, what does sun allow them to do? Photosynthesis. Right, photosynthesis, okay. So they're allowed to make more and more sugar because the days are longer. And if they're flowering at that time, what does the flower eventually become? Fruit. Fruit. Yes, okay. <laughs> The flower is the reproductive organ, and I think we talked about this yesterday, okay, the reproductive organ of the plant. Okay, when it's fertilized, it will become fruit. Fruit has tons of sugar in it. Okay? And so for a plant to make fruit means it has to use a lot of photosynthesis. It has to divert a lot of the energy from photosynthesis into the fruit. Okay? So what's the advantage of putting your seeds in fruit versus just doing what a dandelion does and just letting them blow away? the advantage. What usually happens to fruit? Would an animal eat it and then when they like poop it out the seeds get fertilized in the ground elsewhere? Exactly. Okay. Fruit has multiple advantages over wind deposited seeds. Okay. If the fruit gets eaten, it goes through the digestive tract of the, of the animal and then is deposited in a nutrient rich medium that could be very far away from the parent plant. If, in some cases, fruit just falls off the plant and the seeds are gonna be right there in the shadow of the plant that produced them, are they going to do very well? No. Not necessarily, unless it's an annual plant that's not gonna grow back, okay? Then it might do just fine. So if it was something like a tomato or something like that, okay, yeah, the next year that parent plant isn't growing back and the seeds will grow and everything will be fine. But for things like apples and oranges and larger fruit that come from trees that grow year after year, 
getting eaten and taken somewhere else is a much better, um, a much better strategy. There are some fruits that will not, their seeds will not germinate unless they have been eaten. Okay? There's actually a tree that is going extinct because the only way its seeds will germinate is if they've been eaten by a dodo bird. Okay. And what happened to the dodo? It went extinct. It went extinct. Okay? There's so many things that depend on other things in the natural world. Okay? So now this, this tree is going to go extinct because its seeds can't germinate because they don't go through the digestive tract as dodo birds and get pooped out. Okay? <laughs> it's just one of those rare symbiotic relationships that, are, that develops. And they're not unheard of. Okay? They're actually a bit more common than you might think. Right? So light influences a lot of behaviors of plants, but also for animals. Okay? Like right now, all the geese are, you know, they're just about done their practicing and now they're, they're starting to fly south. And my kids always notice this, like, those geese are going the wrong way. <laughs> they're not going the wrong way, they're training. Okay? Cause they, they actually do, they fly around in circles for a while okay? and kind of train a little bit before they make the big jaunt. Okay, so, um, but that's cued by length of day. So many behaviors are cued by length of day. That's why daylight savings time is so important. It actually has no effect on that. But we know that the day gets shorter and shorter as fall and, and winter approaches, okay? And that is gonna be the most reliable signal for something to do whatever it needs to do to prepare for winter, okay? Because we know we can get freezing temperatures anytime for a short period of time. Temperature is not as reliable. Okay, wind. Wind is another big factor that affects plant growth. Okay, um, and it affects it in a couple of different ways. It can change the availability of water. All right, I mean, we've seen, if you get, you know, we get some snow and then a Chinook comes through, not only does it melt the snow, it dries up the water too, okay, because that, that moving air is very, uh, is very good at picking up and taking away all the water vapor, okay, and increasing the rate of evaporation. It's why sitting in front of a fan makes you feel cooler than if you're just sitting in that same room without one. The moving air increases the rate at which your sweat evaporates, which helps to cool your body faster. Okay? So, same thing happens for plants. Okay? Now, we're also coming up on the super cold part of the year where wind chill is going to start being something we hear more about. Okay? Wind chill is how cold it feels versus how cold it actually is, right? So they're always saying, well, it's minus 20, but with the wind chill, it feels like minus a million, okay? Um, and that's because the wind, again, increases the rate at which moisture evaporates from your skin, and that can make it feel colder, okay? Because it's taking energy to evaporate the water, and that energy usually comes from you. That's how sweat works. When sweat evaporates off your body, it takes energy from your body to do it, so you feel cooler. Okay, so with wind chill, same idea. And, and you got the moisture evaporating from your skin. Even though it's very cold outside, the water can still turn to a vapor and you feel colder. Right? That affects plants as well. Another thing it can do is it can affect um, the shape of a plant. Okay? Um, lots of, of plants will do what's called thigmotropism, which we're going to talk about next week, which is a growth response to touch. If you've ever seen some of those bamboo things that you can buy, that, like they're in a coil. You guys seen those? Nope. You guys seen those? Okay. So you, they, they'll grow bamboo, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll have the bamboo plant in a pot, okay? And um, they'll, put, they'll put a pipe in the pot, and they'll just keep pinning the bamboo to the pot, and it'll, or to the pipe, and it'll grow in a spiral. Then they pull the pipe out, and they sell you this like really cool looking piece of bamboo, but it's, it's a spiral. Okay? It's called thigmotropism. It's just growth response to touch. Okay? But wind can be one of the kind of touch factors that can influence the shape of a plant. If you go down to like Lethbridge or Pincher Creek, all the trees grow like this. Okay? All bent to the east because the wind always blows out of the west. Okay? In the mountains, um, near the tree line, you'll often see uh, uh, spruce trees and they'll grow like this. You can see there's no branches or needles on this side of the tree because what they do is they grow in what's called a crummels form and they'll only grow branches here. Wind comes from this direction so they grow their branches on the underside. Okay? If you're looking at it from the top, here's the trunk of the tree 
all the branches grow in this area here, and none of them grow here. Why not? What would the wind do to any of the branches that are on the side that's always exposed to the wind? Break It'll break them off. Yeah. Okay. And they'll be exposed to wind chill and all that other stuff that's hard on the plant. When they grow in this form, these branches here are sheltered by the trunk of the tree, and when it snows and it's blowing the snow, this shape acts like a snow fence, and it'll create a drift right over the entire tree, and then it'll be buried and protected on the icy cold winds. But couldn't also like some plants use this to like as a good thing because they could grow like all their seeds on one side of the tree, so when the wind hits it, they kind of like fly away. Well, this is a good thing, because this protects them. It, it's not really going to do much for their seeds so much, um, because in, in actual fact, growing their seeds are all going to be in here where there isn't any wind. right? They're going to be sheltered from the wind, so their cones are just going to fall straight down. But most spruce trees, not all, but most, um, their cones are coated in a resin that only um, will release the seeds if the pine cone is burnt. Okay. So it has to be exposed to really high temperatures like would happen in a forest, forest fire. All right. So that way you don't get young spruce trees trying to grow in the shadow of their strong living parents okay, um, that'll shade them up and kill them. Okay. So they don't generally release the seeds until the parent plants are dead. Okay. Usually a fire is what does that. So um, they have that kind of adaptation to survive. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so wind can be a big factor. Okay, it can influence the shape of the plants, and the shape of the plant obviously influences how much it's going to grow, okay, things like that. Okay, rocks and soil. What do plants get from the soil? Nutrients. Nutrients, okay. So if we've got really thick, luxuriant, healthy soil, like we would have around here, okay, plants do pretty well. Right? If you buy just you know, the potting soil from, from the garden center, okay, plants grow really well and it's full of nutrients. Okay? But if you go and try and grow them in soil like this, how well is it going to do? Not that well. Not that well. Okay? So when I put this trowel in the ground, that was as deep as I could put it in the ground. Okay? There's actually a rock behind it holding it up because I couldn't put it in the ground far enough that it would stand up on its own. Okay? How thick is that soil? Not thick at all. The ground, like look at all the rock here. Okay, this is like a little bit of dirt on top of rock, right? I'm not going to get big trees growing here. There isn't enough soil to support them. All that's growing here, okay, are like you know a few little hardy grasses and some sedge and stuff like that. That's you know really hardy and can grow in really thin soils. This soil won't hold much moisture. It'll dry out very quickly, especially with all the rocks. Okay, getting hot in the sun, okay, so it's not a great soil. Not a lot of things can grow there. So the type of soil in an area influences what kind of plants can grow there. That influences what kind of animals can live there, and so on and so on. So rocks and soil have a big effect on that. Around here, our soil is quite good. It's a bit sandy, but it's, it's still pretty good. You get lots of grasses growing, so we get lots of deer, and you know we can have herds of cattle and stuff like that because there's enough food to keep them going. Okay, periodic disturbances. Okay. Periodic disturbances are an important factor affecting plant growth as well. Okay, and it's for this reason. They can radically redistribute the available resources. Okay, a forest fire radically redistributes the resources in the environment. Okay, it first off destroys the mature forest that was there which means all those trees are now dead and any nutrients in the soil are now fully available for something else. What's one of the first things to grow after a fire? Fireweed. Okay, fireweed grows almost right away after a fire and it's got free run of all the nutrients in the soil and it's going to get a little more sun because what's happened to the trees? Yeah, they've lost all their needles or leaves or whatever so now a lot more sun gets to the ground. The other thing that happens, what I was talking about a minute ago with the pine cones. Okay? The pine cones are sealed in this resin and when that resin gets burnt, the pine cones kind of pop and the seeds get released and then the young spruce can start to grow. Young spruce don't like to be in direct sunlight, but they need some sun. Okay? So they're getting shade 
from the dead trees that haven't fallen down yet, okay? Because the trees don't fall down right away, okay? It's a few years usually before they start to fall down, all right? So those little spruce can get, you know, reasonably mature okay, in the shade, and then as the bigger plants fall down, they kind of just take over, right? And they do a bit better, right? This is one of the reasons why when they clear cut an area, okay, um, they, they actually have to plant about twice as many trees as were there because half of them are gonna die. Little sapling spruce do not like direct sunlight. And when you clear cut an area, you've kind of taken away all the shade. Okay? So you've got all these little saplings directly exposed to the sun in an area that doesn't get tons of rain, and so they don't often do all that well. Right? Um, they have to, like you say, plant about twice as many as they want them to do well. Okay? All right, other periodic disturbances, hurricanes. Okay. Hurricanes will topple, okay, kind of older, diseased trees, okay, things like that. That redistributes how much sunlight can get to the ground. It usually um, also involves some flooding, which can bring nutrients and minerals and things like that into an area. Um, it can also erode soil or move it from one place to another. Um, so uh, severe thunderstorms and tornadoes and stuff like that do about the same thing as a hurricane. Okay, uh, flooding. Flooding is another big one. When in 2013, okay, when we had our big floods here, there was mud and silt everywhere. Okay? And that mud and silt is full of nutrients. Okay? And it got redistributed onto the floodplains. And now, okay, it's almost 10 years later now, or eight years later, okay, um, we've got lots of willows and stuff growing on the, on the banks of the rivers again because of all that nutrient stuff that got deposited there. Uh, volcanic eruptions. Two different kinds of volcanic eruptions, okay? One would be a sterilization event, okay? That would be like what you'd see in Hawaii with the big lava flows, okay? So molten rock going down the mountainside, destroying everything in its path and sealing it in a you know, layer of obsidian. That, that's a start over, okay? That nothing is surviving that. That's a catastrophic event, okay? Um, everything has to start from scratch. If you get one that's more ash, Okay, certainly the area closest is still going to be obliterated, but it's not sealed in rock. Volcanic ash is actually full of lots of nutrients. Okay? It's why places like Greece and Italy um, have such good grape crops and olive crops. Okay? Those are very nutrient demanding plants, but they have all this volcanic soil. Okay? It's full of nutrients. Okay? Um, yeah, so things like that. It's, it's basically a, a, a periodic disturbance is going to change what resources are available. Sometimes that's by killing what's there, okay? um, and that's fine. Stuff has to happen, right? It's called succession. Okay? Things like that have to go on. Okay, now, the biotic factors. Okay, this was all just non-living stuff, right? We haven't even talked about the other organisms in a plant's environment, all right? The biggest factor Big, biggest biotic factor affecting a plant is what? What other part of the environment would affect a plant more than anything else? Other plants. Okay. Not, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of you are thinking the animals that eat the plant, right? Because that's that's usually where our head goes. But it's actually the other plants. Okay? Animals can only eat so much. And they don't generally kill a plant when they eat it. Okay? They damage it for sure, but it grows back. Plants compete with each other. So the presence of other plants is the biggest biotic factor because they need the same resources. They all need sunlight. They all need water. They all need nutrients in the soil, all of that. So they have to compete with each other for that. And they have lots of strategies, believe it or not, for competition between members of their own species or members of different species. Okay. Uh, anybody have a big spruce tree in their yard? Anything grow under it? Okay. Nothing grows under a spruce tree for a couple of reasons. That's where the spruce tree's roots are and it's pulling a lot of moisture from there. Okay. It's also highly shaded under there. But there's also lots of pine needles on the ground. And pine needles contain chemicals that essentially poison the soil to anything else. Okay. Spruce trees can tolerate it because they make them themselves. But other organisms cannot. And so 
by poisoning the soil around your roots, you make sure nothing else grows where your roots are. And then you have all of the stuff that's in that soil to yourself. Okay? Um, lots of plants will you know, just kind of grow taller than other plants and try and shade them out, okay? and grow deeper roots or spread their roots out more. All of those things are ways to compete with each other. Okay? The next thing that would be kind of a big biotic factor would be the herbivores, okay? the animals that are going to eat the other animals. Or sorry, eat the plants, sorry. Um, obviously, that's going to affect them. They're going to have to grow back after an event like that. Um, and then you've got all of your parasitic organisms, okay? things that would grow on the plant and kind of feed off of it but not kill it. Okay? You've got your decomposing organisms that make the nutrients available in the soil, okay? um, bugs and, and things like that, all that are actually helpful to the plant okay? are also the living parts of their environment. Fungi would be another one. They're, okay, they're um, helping to decompose things. Uh, carpenter ants, anybody ever come across those before? or woodcutter ants are more common around here. Okay. You find them in rotting trees, and they're mean as hell. Okay. Um, you have to be mindful of them if you're, if you're cutting down trees. Okay. Uh, so if you got like you know, a tree that's standing but it's dead, and you cut it down, um, it could be full of ants. Okay. I know this from experience. I used to work at a golf course, and we were taking down some of the dead falls that wouldn't you know, like fall on golfers. And, uh, I was wearing shorts, which is my first mistake. Okay, I had the chainsaw and I'm going through this thing, and then I hit a nest that was in the middle of the tree. So I never, never knew it was there, never saw it coming. And all of a sudden, instead of spitting out sawdust, the chainsaw is spitting out ants. Okay, right onto my legs. Yeah, oh, those things bite hard. Okay. And they were very upset. <laughs> and they were very upset when I cut into that tree. Uh, so they, what they were doing was essentially just decomposing the tree, right? They built their nest in there and they were eating the tree, okay? But they're kind of like termites. They just, they'll, they'll eat through a tree in no time at all, okay? But that helps to decompose it. So they're, they're useful when you're not making them angry. All right, is that making sense? Okay. Uh, so when we're looking at our lab design next week, okay, on uh, Tuesday, on Tuesday, okay? Um, you're going to be picking something that's going to be a factor that affects plant growth, and you're just going to design an experiment to test it. Okay? You're not actually going to run this experiment. You're just going to design it. So you're going to have a problem, your variables, your hypothesis, a list of materials that you would need, and a procedure that you would follow. And that's it. Okay? You can't do anything else after that because you're not actually running the experiment. Okay? But there'll be some things that you'll want to think about. First off, what factor do you want to test? Okay. You could test any number of things. You could test uh, amount of lights, amount of water, color of lights. Okay. Really, you, the list is endless. You can test really anything you want. Um, what you just have to make sure you do is kind of control everything else. So the importance of this lesson is knowing what are some of the other things that could affect the growth of a plant so that you can list them in your control variables and make sure that they're going to be uh, the same for all of your um, test subjects and things like that. Okay. Okay, when plants take up the, um, the, the water and nutrients, so this is separate from the factors affecting plant growth, okay? So this is um, kind of what the inside of the, the root looks like. So you got the epidermis, okay? Still that layer we were talking about, but inside the root, there's a cortex, and then there's a vascular cylinder, okay? So this vascular cylinder, this red part is the phloem, okay? And the inside here is all xylem. Okay, and so water gets absorbed through the cortex. The cortex is where that osmotic pressure that will pull water in from outside gets set up. Okay, and then it can flow into the, the xylem from there. Okay. That's all we need to know about that. Okay, two different groups that plants can fall into. Okay, there are going to be your hydrophytes or hydrophiles. Okay. Uh, what does the suffix file mean? Yes, loving, okay, to love, okay, file means loving. So if you're a hydrophyte or a hydrophile, okay, means you love incredibly wet environments, all right? So this would be like lilies, like water lilies that can grow right out of a swamp, okay, or rice that grows in flooded uh, patties, you know, things like that, okay? Uh, anything that can tolerate flooded conditions for long periods of time, these trees here, Okay. They have. They live in uh, in the rainforest, and the rainforest is flooded much of the year. 
Okay? And so they have these special roots that serve two purposes. They anchor them when the floodwaters are rushing by to keep them from being washed away, but they also act like a snorkel. Around here, our plants, if they're flooded or submerged for any length of time, they die because the roots suffocate. They can't get any oxygen, they can't carry out cellular respiration, and the roots die. Okay? These plants have these special roots that stay above the water line and allow oxygen to be absorbed from the air, which can then be fed to the roots. Okay? So they have this adaptive system to highly flooded environments. And just to give you an idea, if I stood next to that tree, that's how tall I would go. No, about six feet tall. And so those snorkel roots go up a long way okay, to stay out of the floodwaters. All right, and then there are xerophytes, okay, or xerophiles. These are uh, plants that can tolerate incredibly arid or dry conditions. Most of the adaptations that xerophytes have are either incredibly thick leaves, okay, um, or no leaves at all, like a cactus, okay? And they would carry out that special kind of cam photosynthesis that we looked at yesterday with that weird leaf, okay, that had, okay? Um, so they would do that, but they can tolerate drought for long periods of time because they can hold a lot of water in their tissues, okay? And uh, that keeps them uh, from obviously desiccating. Um, what's another adaptation that a lot of plants will use if either a long winter or, an, or a, let's say a dry season is coming about? What will they do? What do our plants do before winter? Store a bunch of water. They drop their leaves. They actually don't store any water. Uh, yeah, we don't want to have water in the trunk of a tree or any part of a tree during the winter because what does water do when it freezes? It would expand and crack the tree open, right? Um, has anyone ever seen that happen? Okay. It looks pretty wild, actually. If, if you get like a hard freeze once the leaves are on the trees, you can actually see the cracks form in the tree. What's even cooler is when a tree gets struck by lightning. Yeah. Okay. Anyone ever seen that? It literally explodes. Okay, because the sap boils, instantly vaporizes, and just the tree just explodes. Okay, uh, you don't want to be near it because uh, electricity in that volume is bad, and the explosion can throw shrapnel, okay, pieces of tree that can hit you and impale on you. So yeah, anyway. We have a tree that Yeah, right down the middle. Yeah, because that that sap in the middle, the xylem sap, that's the watery stuff that boils first, and of course when it, it boils, it expands and it just pushes it outwards and it'll crack it right now. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so plants will, before a drought or before freezing, will prepare to become dormant. And so what they do is they secrete a certain hormone that we'll talk about next week that actually causes chlorophyll production to stop. Okay? And when that chlorophyll production stops, the leaves turn. Okay? They go from being green, because there's no more chlorophyll, to showing all the other photosynthetic pigments that are always there, okay? the orange and the red and things like that. Okay? And then um, once the chlorophyll has stopped being produced, there's no more need for water to be transported and the tree essentially empties of water. Leaves fall off and the tree's ready for winter or a drought, as the case may be. Okay, um, right, so plants lose their leaves. We just talked about that. We talked about the cam plants, so yeah. Um, This cactus here, how old is it? Old. Very, very old. A saguaro cactus won't grow its first arm until it's at least 80. Okay, so if you see a saguaro cactus that has lots of arms, it's very, very old. Okay, they can live to be uh, even a thousand or more years old. Most of the cacti in the desert, believe it or not, are just two, okay? Um, and then they grow their arm later, much later. Yeah. All right, we'll leave it at that for today.